the cloud. I like my brain. It's it's the quarantine. It's okay. It's not so, only that. It's, you know, I'm six hours later, so I've been up for six hours longer, and it's seven o'clock in the evening, and my mind's starting to go. Anyway, that's fair. That's really fair. Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Tamara Shovelton. Um, I have a master's in European history. I specifically um, research and write about Tudor history. Um, I'm in the process of trying to write this book on Elizabeth's relationships from her youth and the relationships that impacted her in terms of um, the skills that she learned to become the queen that we know and love. Um, aside from that, I'm, I'm also cur currently working on a second master's degree in World War II history because, you know, why not? And I teach at college and this semester has been, as many of you know, if you have children, challenging with the online learning. So for those of you who are currently homeschooling, my hat's off to you because it is difficult to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that is um, basically me in a nutshell, to be fair. Okay. So when we spoke before, I, we kind of walked through chron chronologically um, but I think there are a couple of ones that I wanted to dig into a little bit deeper, um, specific or kind of earlier in her life. And then also at the end, I mentioned like the Essex affair and I've been reading more about that and sort of her romantic relationships there too. Um, so maybe we can just have this be Elizabeth's romantic relationships. And so <laughs> is that all right? No, no, um, but I do that's also fine. want to ask about Catherine Parr too, because, and that leads us into Tom Seymour, which could be the beginning of the romantic list. So what can you tell me about that triangle? So, so the Seymour affair is, is probably the most, uh, well, is the most widely talked about affair because of the age of Elizabeth when it happened. Um, so, so Elizabeth would have been about 13 when she actually, you know, started kind of coming into her own as a woman. Um, and her relationship with Catherine Parr is a little, um, I think it's sort of a little deceitful when we read about it, because when we read about the relationship between Elizabeth and Catherine Parr, we read it from this sort of like, acknowledgement that Catherine Parr was like a second mother to Elizabeth. And if it hadn't been for Catherine Parr, you know, she wouldn't have made it into the act of succession and her father wouldn't have done this and that and the other thing for her. And Catherine Parr is responsible for like Elizabeth becoming such a learned um, human. But th the truth is Catherine Parr had very little to do with Elizabeth while Henry VIII was alive. And if we really think about it, Elizabeth began to be tutored when she was very young. She lived in the household um, with Mary, her, her older sister. Then once her younger brother was born, she lived in his household. Um, so she was brought up in with education because it was so important at that time. Um, so that's one thing. Her, her education, by the time Catherine Parr came in, Elizabeth was fluent in Italian, in Latin, in French. I mean, I mean she was very learned. So Elizabeth, uh, Catherine Parr really didn't have anything to do with that per se. Um, and then when we read things, we read things that say, oh, oh, Elizabeth, she was banished from court. What happened? What happened was the King of England went to war with France, okay? And to be fair, Elizabeth was not a permanent member of court to begin with because of her age, because she was so young, and because court is a very dangerous place, okay? So when Henry VIII went off to France um, to fight the war, right, Elizabeth was not banished as much as she was sent to a country home to live for her own safety. You know, um, so there was no banishment. In fact, prior to Henry VIII going to war in France, he specifically had a dinner party put together for just him and his children. Catherine Parr wasn't even invited. So it was just him, Mary, and Edward, a chance for him to see his children. Um, and so there was no banishment. And she was brought back to court right when her father came back from the war. It's 
you know, a totally sort of natural thing at this time period. Um, in terms of the acts of succession, um, Henry had already started putting together the act of succession in terms of bringing back both Mary and Elizabeth into that act of succession before he even married Catherine Parr. And if we really like, if we really thought about Henry VIII and like his, how he was like such a, like a, a machismo, right? He was not going to sit down with his new wife and say, so dear, what do you think? Should I put the girls in? Should I leave them out? What's your opinion? Because remember, when he thought that she was trying to school him on Protestantism and religion, he almost cut her head off. I mean, she was this far from, from kicking it. So I think it's, it's sort of disastrous to read these things that make it seem like this, this relationship with Catherine Parr was so much more than what it was. It was at the end of the day, it's Henry who decided to put not just Elizabeth, but Mary back into the line of succession, right? Th that was his decision. It didn't have anything to do with, um, had nothing to do with Catherine Parr. And then on Henry's death, um, the relationship with Catherine Parr is going to like fragment and change completely because while Henry was alive, Elizabeth was going to be extremely respectful to her because she wanted to be seen as a good child in her father's eyes. Remember, Elizabeth grew up understanding what Mary went through, mm -hmm. you know, when Mary was, um, you know, bastardized and when Mary herself almost, you know, got her head cut off when she refused to accept her father as the head of the church. And so she, she understood like the importance of being loyal to her father and to whoever her father was married to. So mm -hmm. the idea that, you know, Elizabeth sent these gifts and these special trinkets and things to um, Catherine Parr is, would have been completely normal. I mean, of course she would have done that because her father would have found out about that, right? This was more to keep in his favor than it was to keep in her favor. So mm -hmm. Henry VIII dies and Thomas Seymour um, comes in because he is the uncle to the new King Edward, right? And he's the uncle who thought he was going to have equal power over the reign of Edward, right? That he and his brother were both going to share that power. Um, and in, in, in actuality, that's kind of how it should have been because Henry VIII had planned to have a group, an actual council that was supposed to all work together to help with the reign of Edward until he each reached his maturity. But his uncle, right, took over, you know, and made himself the protectorate of the realm. And so it was really his uncle who was in control and the council sort of answered to him. So when Thomas Seymour felt slighted by what his brother did, he started to think like, what can I do, right, to maintain a foothold in this realm, to have power, to have money, to be on top. And so obviously when we think, especially at this time period, right, the most, the easiest way, right, to gain influence and power and money is through marriage, right? That's the easiest way to do it. So who do you marry? How, who do you marry? You're Thomas Seymour, who do you marry, right? So Thomas Seymour, first he tried to marry Mary. His original idea was that he was going to marry Mary, right? The next in line, but Mary wasn't having it. And then he thought, oh, well, I could marry Elizabeth, right? And so the information that we have about this like sort of strange triangle between Mary and Thomas and Elizabeth comes from these letters of Gregorio Letty, who was an Italian who lived at the time and supposedly wrote this like, um, basically would have been like um, the inquirer of the times, right? <laughs> um, and unfortunately, there's no like lasting piece of this book that he wrote because it was um, banished. He was banished from England. No one was allowed to read it. So there's like bits and pieces of things that we can find, but there's no way to um, say whether or not what we're reading and what's left behind of Gregorio Letty's remarks are true or not. So we have to sort of um, think about them in context of what's going on and what happens to, to kind of decipher whether or not um, or how much truth there is in what happened. 
Um, I tend to think that Gregorio Letty, while I feel like he probably exasperated some of his information, you know, inflated it, I do think there is some truth to what he's saying in terms of Thomas Seymour trying to figure out who he could marry. Um, once he realized that he couldn't marry either of the king's sisters, mainly because Henry had put it in his will, right? They could only get married if they were to maintain their, their right to succession, maintain their allowance that they were supposed to get and everything else. They could only get married if they had the permission of the king and the king's council. All right. Mm -hmm. With neither girls willing to even like broach that topic, considering their father had just died, um, and his brother being the protectorate, this would be very difficult for Thomas Seymour to get permission to marry these two girls. So then he started thinking, what's the next best solution? So who's the next best person to marry if you're not gonna marry the king's sisters, right? Mm -hmm. And so then you have to go, it ha has to be the queen, right? The dowager queen, because she would be considered the next highest female, right? in England, so it makes sense to marry her. So the nice thing for Seymour and Catherine Parr is that they had had a romantic relationship prior to her marrying the king. Actually, she was very much in love with him. She had planned to marry him, but then the king, right, Henry VIII, kind of took a liking to her and sent Thomas far, far away. And how does one say no to the king? The only person who successfully did that, right, was Anne Boleyn. And we do sort of see what happened to her in the end. But she did successfully say no to his, like, you know, let's be lovers, let's, you know. Um, so she felt it was God's will that she married Henry, and so she did. So once Henry was gone, there is like this period of mourning that a queen is supposed to go to through. And part of this period of mourning is to make sure that, right, the queen isn't incidentally pregnant with a new heir, but Catherine didn't wait. She secretly married um, Thomas Seymour right away, right? To the disgust of many to include Henry's children. And then Seymour, you know, um, gets access to the young king and gets his permission for the marriage. So nobody can do anything about it. Um, so now you have this marriage, right? With these with these two people. And then of course, um, Elizabeth ends up going and being put under the guardianship of Catherine Parr, right? So now Catherine, her husband, this young Elizabeth are all living together, right? And so that's sort of where, where it takes off. And Elizabeth is starting to come into her like womanhood because at this time frame, between 13 and 16, I mean, that was a ripe age to get married. There would have been nothing weird or disgusting or, you know, no thoughts of pedophilia at this time. It, it, it was just a normal progression. Um, so there was nothing, there was nothing inherently wrong with her, like, coming into her own at this time. The problem really exists with coming into her own in a relationship with a, someone who's married to her guardian, right? That's where I think the real problem with this relationship gets is Thomas Seymour was meant to act more as a stepfather, a paternal figure, and instead he becomes a romantic interest, right? And Catherine Parr, who is so enamored with Thomas Seymour and she's so in love with him and she's so happy that she finally, this is her fourth marriage, she finally gets to marry the person that she loves rather having to marry someone because her mother set up or because she's a widow and she needs a marriage or because the king, you know, hits Henry. So what do you do? Um, that she was willing to let Thomas have a very long leash in terms of the way he acted and his participation with Elizabeth. So being that Catherine Parr is a very staunch Protestant, but like at the same time, one of her favorite pastimes is dancing. And so she would always have dancing in her house, but Thomas would always dance with Elizabeth and they would flirt. And the dancing at the time um, is a very particular dance. Um, it's sort of hard to describe it in a non-disgusting way, but there's a, there's a way in which the women are, are lifted up, you know? Is this like the Volta or something? Is yeah. That 
yeah, there's like okay. a way that that women are lifted up and and the men have to you know i see okay so so there's so this so so this is going on at the same time this is going on right thomas seymour is actively pursuing elizabeth he's going into her bedroom he's going in with just his shift on with no underclothing you know he's trying to get in bed with her he's touching her bottom you know um supposedly caught in some sort of an embrace and and some parts of this Catherine Parr is participating with him, right? Mm -hmm. And so this becomes very sort of entangled and, and messy um, mm -hmm. to the point where eventually Catherine Parr, as, as the historical writing goes, catches them in some sort of an embrace. And at this point she's pregnant, right? And so she sends Elizabeth away, not just because she's pregnant and like she can see that this relationship is getting out of control, but she sends Elizabeth away for her own safety and Elizabeth's safety and the safety of her husband because should this matter get out of control, right? They're all in a very dangerous situation now, right? So obviously Catherine's gonna die. That could be kind of treason for all of them, couldn't it? it treason for all of them, all of yeah. them. Yeah. It's a, just a bad situation. Um, so Catherine Parr dies, and then of course her daughter dies, um, and Thomas immediately, without batting an eye, starts to figure out what's my next move. I got to get back in with Elizabeth, and so he continues to sort of court Elizabeth with the help of Elizabeth's um, lady in waiting, um, Catherine Astley. Right, that she's very, very much she loves Thomas Seymour. She thinks he's amazing. He's very handsome. He's tall. He's educated. He knows how to dance. He knows how to perform, right? He's strong. He's masculine. These are the things that Elizabeth in the future is going to look towards when she looks towards like the men that are going to be in her life and her favorites. They're all going to resemble Seymour in some way, shape, or form, right? So they continue this sort of back and forth well, I want to marry you. Well, I can't get married without this. And, um, and then ultimately what's going to happen is word's going to get back to the protectorate and some information's going to get out and, and Elizabeth's going to end up on house arrest. Thomas Seymour is going to end up arrested, but why? Because, you know, taking the king hostage and killing his dog. His dog, yeah. I mean, that's a real thing. Yeah. I feel like, I like maybe if he hadn't killed the dog, this might have turned out differently. But he went in, in in hopes of securing the king and getting the king to say, yes, you can marry my sister. But what he did was try to secure the king and kill the king's dog. And so then he ends up arrested. And this whole like story about him wanting to marry Elizabeth comes out. And then people that were in the household are like, oh, well, I remember seeing this and that and the other thing. And that's sort of how we get into this um, area where Elizabeth is, um, you know, under house arrest and she's being basically browbeaten every day. Confess, 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 confess. And all of the people who are closest to her are put in the Tower of London and they're, you know, asked to confess, confess, confess every day. And Thomas Perry is going to be the first one to break. And he was basically um, the person in charge of all of the money and accounts for Elizabeth. And he says, yes, this happened, blah, 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 blah. And then once he breaks, um, Catherine Astley is actually going to confess as well. Um, and so this is a really like important moment for Elizabeth because they come back to her and say, we have these written confessions from both, right, Astley and Perry. Here you are, look at them. Now you can't deny anything that happened. Um, but Elizabeth, instead of saying, okay, fine, let me just like sit down and just tell you everything. She says, I'll talk to you tomorrow, right? I'll, I'll discuss this tomorrow, I need to go. And she reads what they've written and really nothing that they've written incriminates her in any way. And so she basically agrees with what they've said in terms of, you know, he wanted to help her. He wanted to help her get her titles. He wanted to possibly maybe marry her, but he understood that he had to ask these people. Um, so when she confesses, she's really not confessing to anything except like, 
the fact that he was trying to help her with um, getting some of her lands and things that had been given to her um, by the king. So she's very smart in terms of the fact that she waits, right? Mm -hmm. And doesn't like answer right away that she thinks about what is it that's going to be best for for me. And I think this is one of those skills that she ultimately really like learned and understood from Mary, because when Mary was in that situation where, um, you know, she had to make decisions about whether she was going to um, succumb to her father or like stick to her um, Catholicism, that was something that Mary really had to think about. And then she wrote a letter to her father, right? And basically said, okay, I'm going to do all of this stuff. So that was really important for Elizabeth. And then what's what's more problematic in all of this is as all of this is happening, um, the rumor mill at the time is just going out of control, right? Oh, some people are saying Elizabeth is pregnant and she had a child and there's this and that and the other thing. And so Elizabeth really has to think like, like this is really tarnishing her reputation and your reputation at this time period was like the most important thing. So she had to start thinking about like, what am I going to do? So she understands that the most important thing she can do now is to start to advocate for herself. And in doing that, she has to write letters to the protectorate. Like, you know, it's your job to make sure that people don't slander me and they're slandering me and you've done nothing about it. So here's what I'll do. I'll come to court to prove to you that I'm not pregnant and to testify that I've you know, never had sexual relations with that man. Um, right? And so were the- they, Were they looking, can I just ask you a question? Were they negotiating any kind of, for, for her to be married at all at this point? Was there any kind of talk of that yet? No, so her marriage negotiations began when she was a year old and ended when she was three. And then they began again in earnest when Mary was queen. Okay. So there were actual no like active nego negotiations for the marriage of Elizabeth until Mary was queen. Um, I wonder why that is because she was at such a good age for that then. Like, well, were they too busy with war with Scotland or something? Like, <laughs> Well, if you think about it, she, she was at a very good age for that, but here's the thing. If we try to marry Elizabeth off at this time when her brother is still young, right? We yeah. could end up marrying her off to someone more powerful, right? We have to think about in terms of the power dynamics at the time, it would have been more important to get Edward to age mm -hmm. and get him married, right? And then get Mary married and then get Elizabeth married. Um, you know, in order to tear it, to make sure that they're getting the most powerful marriages that are going to work best for the country versus just marrying her off to marry her off. Um, so, so Elizabeth was really an active in terms of writing these letters to the protectorate to say like, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. Like, you know, yes, you know, my mistress, Astley, she made some bad decisions in talking to Thomas about marrying me, but it was innocent. And I, of course, would never have done anything without the permission of the council and the king. Um, you know, and so she did all of this. And then, of course, Thomas Seymour is, is going to die from beheading, right? And Elizabeth learns from this, from this like triangle between her and Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour. She learns a couple of things. One, she learns first and foremost, like how dangerous it is to like fall in love with someone and to allow your emotions to get a hold, to, to get a hold of everything over your brain, right? So that's like the first thing. She also learns how to, um, actively um hmm i love when the words in my brain but then it just won't come out like advocate for herself thank you she learns how to actively advocate for herself which is going to come in handy as she um gets older and when she becomes queen um she also you know, learn something very important. So at the end of this, with all of these rumors and things that have, uh, you know, gone on about her, she understands like she needs to take a step back 
and like take a lower profile. She becomes very docile, like in the way that she dresses and the way that she acts in order to prove, right, her submission, not just to the crown, but to understanding that the way that the public perceives her is so inherently important, right? If they think that she is um, a tart, right? then that's gonna affect her. So she she becomes very much like, um, dresses very, you know, not extensively. She becomes very like um, Protestant in terms of like the Bible and things like things like that that she was doing before, but she makes a point that, that people can see her public image. Like she understands the use of propaganda because she used it against, um, the protector by saying like, you know that you have to take care of this. Like you, you need to make this look better for me. Um, mm -hmm. So it becomes really important for her. And then, like I said, as she goes on, as she gets older, every man or favorite that she's going to have is going to some way resemble Seymour. And when we get to Essex, like the thing that's like so amazing about Essex is it's like, it's like a complete 360 turn. Like here she was with Seymour, the young, very young person being pursued by this much older person, right? And then when we switch it to Essex, here's Elizabeth, this very old woman or older woman who basically um, helps raise Essex. Like, you know, she helps pay for his education. She watches him as he becomes older, right? She's this very like motherly figure. And then all of a sudden, they're involved in this sort of like romantic relationship. And here he was like the stepson of Dudley. So there's that sort of like new factor there. Um, and then when you get towards the end, like he dies in the exact same way and fashion as Seymour doing the exact same stupid thing because he thinks, oh, I'm gonna kidnap Elizabeth. I'm gonna force her to marry me and I'm gonna be king. Well. And then he gets yeah. his head cut off, right? So it's so kind of like profound that the first relationship and her last major relationship are like mirror images of each other. I think it like, mm -hmm. it's sort of appropriate for Elizabeth, but it's like crazy when you look at how similar they are in terms of the way that they happen. It's just the difference is Elizabeth goes from being the young, naive, immature, woman to the, you know, very mature, very educated woman that maybe takes advantage of this young man. Mm -hmm. So like, that's, that's sort of that whole thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of smarmy when you, like you said, it's just kind of not, not the nicest. I, I don't know. It's just, it, it's kind of almost, what, was it like predatory almost with her and him? And with Essex? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. She saw him. I, I really feel she saw him like as the new Dudley. Like yeah. she was so very much in love with Robert Dudley and their relationship had like, like great highs and like exceptionally low lows, but he was always right. No matter whether he was out of favor and there was a new favorite, um, you know, it always came back to Dudley. Everything always came back to Dudley. Um, and so once Dudley died, right, the next best thing, if you can't have Dudley, is to have his son that he raised, right? Um, and, and so it is a little, like, sort of creepy, but it's really important when we're studying the Tudor period, especially Elizabeth, that we really um, understand the context of, of what's happening, the time period that we're looking at. Um, it's important not to view these events sort of from our 21st century, like, morals and things like that because if we do that then we're going to say like she was ab abused and Seymour was a, a pedophile and then Elizabeth became a pedophile and it's and it's not that it's it's there are definitely some like disgusting aspects but um for the time period it was totally normal for Elizabeth at 13 to 16 to be in a relationship with an older man but to be married and have children and as queen it was totally appropriate for a king or queen to have relationships with people who were much, much younger than them, right? It wasn't looked upon as sort of like, um, in the way that we would look at it today. Like if 
But today we wouldn't say like, it's okay for a 50 year old woman to have a relationship with a 13 year old kid. Like, but the timing is completely different back then. So yeah. we have to remember that. Um, but still it is a little like, oh. Well, yeah, no, I mean, I can, I, that's a big thing of mine about not putting our past, our judgments now, because also I don't want to be judged in, you know, 200 years for the stuff we do now, like factory farming and the dairy industry and all this kind of stuff that like, when you learn about it, it's like, I think people in 200 years are really going to have some things to say about that. Any, like we do with bear baiting. But anyway, what I wonder is what do people, what did people think about it at the time? Was it at all, like, what was the reactions at the time to these so, relationships? I think at the time, the the relationship between Seymour and Elizabeth was salacious even at the time because there were all these rumors about her being pregnant and having given birth to his baby. And, you know, here, here is this young woman and not just a regular woman, right? The king's daughter, the uh, previous king's daughter, the current king's sister, right? Having this relationship with her stepmother's husband. So it very salacious at the time, but um, and certainly because of the, you know, extreme religiousness going on, right, it would have been like seen, seen as shameful for Elizabeth, that relationship for her, she saw it as her right. Mm -hmm. And then in, in, in my opinion, she saw Seymour as her right. She didn't feel like, um, Catherine Parr had the right to be married to him to be his wife, to have his children, because she still should have been in mourning for her father. And so their relationship really became competitive in terms of the love of Seymour. So for mm -hmm. Elizabeth, it was her right to have Seymour. It was, and, and it didn't matter that he was married to Catherine because Catherine had gone against everything that she was supposed to. She had disgraced the loving, you know, the memory of her husband by so quickly marry and see more anyways. Right, right, right. Got it. Okay. Um, so then of course there's Dudley and then the bookend with Essex, but what other major kind of relationships, what other romantic relationships did she have in her life in between there? Was there so, anybody else? So Sir Walter Raleigh, she had a romantic relationship with him. Um, she was involved in so many marriage negotiations. Um, mm -hmm. And, and she used the marriage negotiations the way her, her father did in terms of her way to get something from the other country, um, whether it was money or allegiance or, or whatever. And once she got what she wanted, right, she really didn't need the marriage anymore. Um, the Duke of Anjou, who she called her frog, right? Um, oh, was that Alan Song? Yeah. Wait. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And, okay, and yeah. so that relationship, I don't think was particularly sexual, but I do think, um, at least on his part, he really did think that the two of them were going to get married. Um, I yeah. don't think that was ever the intention for Elizabeth. Um, but that was a pretty important relationship to her in terms of the connection to France. And then like when he died, she really was like very upset. And she wrote this beautiful letter to his mother about, you know, how she, upset she was over his death. Um, and then of course she had other like small favorites, but like the major ones, uh, like I said, Dudley was going to be there until his death back and forth, back and forth, up and down, depending on what was going on. Um, Sir Walter Raleigh was a, was a big one. And then of course the Essex was a big one. If, and if there had been some smaller ones, okay. I'm sure there were, but I don't have like any like real information about them. Tell me about Walter Raleigh because I don't I don't know that much about that one. Um so so Elizabeth's favorites as much as as much as people want to say well she was a, a virginal queen and you know I don't buy that so much. Um but a handsome man is a handsome man right? And Elizabeth liked to be surrounded by handsome men, and she wanted men to, you know, give her their attention, whether they were giving her their attention so that they could get something out of it. 
um, her relationship with with uh, Walter Raleigh was at a time when she was like on the outs with Dudley. Um, it's the time when um, we have like the discovery, right? Exploration and discovery going on. And he really wanted to go off and, and discover things and do stuff. And Elizabeth was like, no, I need you to stay here with me, right? Stay with me because you love me and this is where you need to be. Um, because she was very poss possessive of the men that, that she considered her favorites. And she didn't want them to go away because she didn't want them to have relationships with anybody else. And Sir Walter Raleigh actually tried to go, got on a ship and he got in a lot of trouble and he got back. Um, and he ended up in the tower. And there's this like story about a ring that Elizabeth gave him and that he could use this ring to get out of any trouble with her. And she was going down the river by the tower and he said, oh, the ring or whatever. But um, I mean, ultimately he was in and out of favor as well. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, like, I haven't written or done anything extensively in their relationship um, because at the same time, he, she was still in the relationship with Dudley. Okay, yeah. And is that when, what years, what years are that? Is that before Dudley got married or is that? I don't, ha I don't have the years on that. I could find out okay. for you though. No, no, no. I was just curious if she had this, yeah, what, if that was like a reaction to him getting married or whatever. Um, so how did she feel about like with Dudley? So then let's, let's talk about Dudley. Um, she met him when they were were both very young and they oh, yeah. were both in the tower together where were they in the tower together at the same time were no okay okay so tell me about how they met maybe but if even if they were in the tower at the same time together they well, never would have, they never remember. would have met like there's there's a couple historians say how they were in the tower together and they secretly they met and stuff um but really what it comes down to is Dudley's family was a very prominent family when Henry VIII was um, in rule. And so Dudley um, was in the, the court circles. So, and he actually was part of Edward's household when Edward was younger um, mm -hmm. until his father, you know, treason. The whole family yeah. falls out of favor um, because of this, but she knew him. She grew up with him. Um, she was at his, you know, she knew about his wedding. She was more than likely she was at his wedding to Amy Robespierre, mm -hmm. uh, Robespierre which is funny because um, one of the Elizabeth movies, can't remember which one, one of the newer ones has like this big thing where like all the men are together and they like call out Robert Dudley for being married. And then Elizabeth is shocked and upset. Well, she yeah. wouldn't have been shocked or upset because she knew he was married um, because she was, you know, more than likely she was there. Um, so she had grown up with him. She knew about him. She was very attracted to him. He was a very handsome, very charismatic um, man. And, and it didn't marry. So it didn't matter that he was married for either of them or like at the time. So there was like this sort of like court life and then like home life. Really? And, his wife lived in the country, right? And never did come to court and he lived at court. So his life at court was um, totally different. And so they had this relationship, having known each other since they were children, growing up together, you know, seeing each other on and off at different things. Um, and it is sort of shocking that she would choose to raise him up considering what his father had done in, in terms of treason but she trusted him and she favored him, right? And so ultimately he does become her master of horse and she does like raise him up a little bit over the years. Um, and he was, I do believe that they were very much in love with each other. And I do think that they were trying to figure out a way that he could divorce his wife so that they could get married, but then his wife died. Right. And that sort of became this huge scandal at the time as well, in terms of like, was it Elizabeth? Did she have his wife killed? Did see, did, um, did Dudley kill his wife? Like, 
what's going on? Because here she lived with, everybody went off to like a fair and she stayed home alone. Well, why was she home alone? And what happened? And so that became a really like sort of scandalous thing at the time. And when that happened, Elizabeth had to send Dudley away. She had to send him back to his country estate to figure out what was going on. And so he could be cleared of these charges. And I think it's really at that time that she starts to have like other favorites. Other people are able to come in um, and get her attention. And there, she has so many favorites over her time as queen. Um, and I just don't know all of them, um, you know. And so here Dudley's thinking, well, if we can get free of this and I can be found innocent and stuff, then like we can get married and it will be grand. Um, but that's not what happens. What happens is he is ultimately cleared of the, you know, of the murder of his wife. And, and now we know going back, you know, that his wife, one of two things, one, she committed suicide and threw herself down the stairs. Or two, there is this um, idea that she suffered from some sort of cancer and was so sick and then she just fell down the stairs and died. Um, but either of which wouldn't have put Dudley in charge. At best, if you wanted to blame Dudley for anything in this situation, would be for neglecting his, life, his wife in general for the court and for Elizabeth. But that does not a murderer make, right? Mm -hmm. So once, um, once he's clear of this, like he really feels like he and Elizabeth are going to be able to make it work. They're going to get married. They're going to do all of these things, which is, which is a great idea. But we're talking about Elizabeth, someone who saw firsthand, right? How marriage worked with her father who was used as a pawn in marriage negotiations, not just from her father, but also from Mary saw firsthand the relationship that Mary had with Philip, right? Mary was so in love with Philip, but the English people hated him, right? And Philip only wanted Mary so that he could control her and be in control of everything. And Elizabeth knew like she was never going to be under the control of a man. And she understood because there's writings from her father that Henry said, a male heir was best. Why? Because a male heir could continue to control and rule the country. A female heir had to be married. And then once she was married, she had to come under the control of her husband. Right. And so Elizabeth understood that, like inherently understood that if she got married, she would not be the one in control of anything anymore. And that was something that really did not sit well with her. She was not the kind of woman to just give up control and say, hey, you know, we'll do this. So there was sort of this period um, where Elizabeth was in this really like love bubble with Dudley. They were in this great love bubble. And she was actually, she had had papers drawn up to raise him up in peerage so that they could be married. So the English population at whole did not want Elizabeth to marry a foreigner. They did not want another foreign king like they had with Mary. What they wanted her to do was to marry a good Englishman, right? But the right Englishman. And Dudley did not fit the terms of the right Englishman. And so public opinion was very much against the raising of Dudley and peerage, was very much against the marriage of Elizabeth to Dudley. And one of these things that Elizabeth learned from, from Mary specifically was the importance of public opinion, the importance of her um, people and what they thought and making sure that they felt that she understood them and listened to them and took heed to what they wanted. And so here she's already, she has these papers to raise them up in peerage and she tears them up, right? And she, she gets rid of them and she's like, no, I'm not doing this. We're not going to get married, right? This is not going to be a thing, um, which deeply hurt Dudley, like deeply, deeply hurt Dudley. Um, and then he really loved her as huh? much as she, do you think she really loved, he really loved her as much as she loved him? 
I think he did. I think he did because he allowed himself to be used as a pawn in a marriage scheme with Mary Queen of Scots. Mary Queen of Scots. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He, she figured, here's the thing. She figured I can't marry him. Yeah. Right. But <laughs> I can marry him to my cousin. And if they get married and they have children, then their children can become the heir, right? The heir presumptive. So he'll still be my man. I can still do whatever I want with him but he's marrying who I'm saying, and I'm, you know, the puppet master doing everything. And he agreed. I mean, he agreed to go to Scotland and to do this, right? Problem was Mary Queen of Scots was not an idiot. Okay. She had already knew about this. Like she knew that this was coming. And in her mind, she says, well, why is he good enough to marry me? I'm a queen, but he's not good enough to marry you. So you're right. sending me your leftovers. I don't think so. Yeah right? No, that's not going to happen. So Mary Queen of Scots was not going to be controlled by Elizabeth. And so that Dudley relationship between the two of them didn't work out the way Elizabeth would have liked it to. And then of course, Dudley licking his wounds is going to marry one of Elizabeth's lady in waitings, right? And this was a huge problem because Elizabeth learned from her mother that your lady in waiting, they have to be above board, right? not involved in any kind of gossip, not involved in any kind of like illicit affair with men. And Elizabeth went a step further and said, you're not allowed to get married and you must stay virgins. Like that's it. So for her lady in waiting to secretly marry her favorite, oh, forget about it. Yeah. yeah. And of course that is going to get Dudley thrown out of court and sent away for a while before he's allowed to come back. Um, but he is allowed to come back. I think, I think yeah. that's the key. She's mad at him. She's upset with him. Her feelings are hurt that he would get married to mm -hmm. one of her ladies in waiting, but also to get married without her permission, without her saying who she should marry. It hurt her deeply, but for him, he was like, you weren't going to marry me. Right. Yeah. So, um, but like I said, she gets over it and she lets him come back and he has a big part to do in the rest of her story until he dies. Right. Mm -hmm. Because of course he's going to bring into her life Essex. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> right. Okay. And that brings us full circle. Yeah. It does. Um, so if people have any questions, I'm just looking, there's no chats yet, but please feel free to type anything or raise your hand. And I am on the lookout for that, watching, watching for those chats and things to come in. Um, so tell me a little bit about the relationship with Essex, because it was, it was like kind of just dysfunctional. We would call it like just kind of dysfunctional all around, like the, the age difference aside, but like he screwed up Ireland and then like came back without permission. And then he caught her without her makeup on, which is like a cardinal sin. Like, <laughs> yeah, he was a knight. He, you know, Essex just, he thought once he gained that position of favorite, and once Dudley passed away, he really felt like that there was nothing he couldn't do that that this old woman wasn't going to forgive him for if he showered her with enough, you know, love and admiration. And so he just made mistake after mistake after mistake. And she did, though, like she did forgive him and she did allow him back um, over and over and over again. So I think she sort of set up this sort of like... Um, dysfunction in their relationship in terms of he would do something he wasn't supposed to and she would say well all right you're so yeah. cute come yeah. on over um yeah. so like she was she was part of that um but at the same time she always understood and I think she tried to make him understand that like um, there's only so far you can go right at the end of the day I'm still the queen and you you know there's a place and you have a place and you have to, you have to find that and stay there. And he just was always pushing that line and trying to push that line. And of course, you know, trying to kidnap the queen and seeing her without makeup on. That's just, I mean, without really, all the lead really and, you know, yeah. that put it over the edge. Right. And then she, there, you can't come back from that. You, you could probably come back from seeing her without makeup, but you can't come back from kidnapping. 
Right. I mean, you're just, you're stuck there. That's it. And I really think like his death, I I do feel like his death was like truly devastating for her. Mm -hmm. You know, it really, it really was very devastating for her. And by that time, I mean, she knew like, Mm -hmm. she knew what she looked like. Yeah. You know, she understand that she didn't wield the same sort of like female power that she had when she was younger. Um, the nice thing about like, I say nice, <laughs> the nice thing about her relationship with Essex was that he did grow to know her when she was younger, right? He had grown up around her. So it's not like he just started this like sort of weird relationship with his granny, you yeah. know, it was, it was a relationship that developed over time. And so even when she got older and less attractive, they still had, you know, a relationship that was built on other things aside from just like physical attraction. But once he was gone, it would be, you'd be hard pressed to be physically attracted to Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Sure. Plus all the lead, just that's not good for your skin. But I mean, you know, they just didn't know any better back in the day. Of course. course. Absolutely. Um, Okay. So then, so we've gone on for almost an hour here. Um, And if people, again, if you have anything you want to add or comment or ask or anything, please feel free to do that. Um, But just what do you think, like, the take, like, if with your book that you're writing on Elizabeth's relationships, like, what would kind of be the main overarching, like, your your thesis statement for one of a better word or like something like what, what about her relationships? Like what are some generalizations about her relationships, especially the romantic ones that we were talking about? So I think the overarching thing is that the relation, so, and I don't focus so much on the relationships she had with people when she was queen. Um, but I, I kind of have devoted a little bit of time to her romantic relationships, which is a little bit different. But I think the overarching thing is the importance of these relationships that she had in her youth. These, these relationships really helped build who she was and her character and who she would become as queen. Because very much like, like Henry, like Henry VIII was the spare. Like he was never supposed to be king. So he was mm-hmm. never taught in the same fashion as his brother you know he was never expected to do certain things so when his brother died right Mm -hmm. his dad then his dad basically wouldn't let him out of his sight but still didn't really teach him anything Mm -hmm. you know and so elizabeth grew up thinking she would never how how like how on earth as the third in line how on earth was she going to become the queen right edward should have had kids mary should have had kids like it never should have gotten to Elizabeth. So she was never taught like how to be queen or how to do present herself. And so these relationships that she had in her youth, they really helped to solidify her strength. And she really learned from them. I mean, it's crazy to think about the things that she learned from her mother, even though she never had a real relationship with her, but the things that she knew about her mother and how she took those things that her mother established when her mother had her own court and built them into her court. Um, in terms of ro- rom- romantic relationships, um, I think she learned a lot, especially from her dad and from Mary in terms of um, the fickleness of love, um, how to use marriage negotiations, right? Mm-hmm. To get what you wanted, but also to understand um, the importance of what the people want and the importance of not letting yourself go. Like Mary was so in love with Philip, like so terribly in love with him. Um, and that didn't help Mary in anything that she did. Um, if anything, it was a crutch for Mary. Um, and the relationship with Seymour, Elizabeth was very, very much in love with him, right? But she saw the damage it did to um, her, it, to her public image. Um, she understood like the damage it could do in terms to the people that were around her and the effects of that. But at the same time, she also understood how she could use that kind of affection, 
right? Mm -hmm. To her advantage. And so I think it's important when we look at all of these relationships that we can see what she did learn. And in part of that, we really have to study that person and then what happened with their relationship mm -hmm. in order to like connect the two things together. Sure, because there's two people involved and they each have their own history. Exactly. So, um, I wanted to ask you something and now I forgot it. Uh, do, 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 do. Well, there's a question here, I might think about it, but there is a question, uh, did Mary ever try to marry Elizabeth off for political gain? Actually, so I actually was thinking about that, so I wrote it down. <laughs> Um, so the answer to that is no. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of Mary, so Mary Tudor was very, very, um, I, I wouldn't say she was jealous of Elizabeth. In some ways she was because Mary was Catholic and Elizabeth was Protestant. And so the people of England, right, had more leaning towards the Protestant Elizabeth, but Mary had her own batch of, of Catholics who like were on her side as well. But for Mary, once Mary became queen, Elizabeth became her nemesis, right? Elizabeth was the person that could usurp the throne, right? And so there was always a fear that a group of people would try to bring about the usurpation of the throne for Elizabeth. And so the idea of how to marry her off, right, was very complicated because who do you marry her to knowing that they're not going to try to exert power, right, and wield yeah. that power. So it became- You have to marry to her to like somebody in Spain or something to- Yeah, you would have to marry her out of the country. Um, so there were, Mary did have some like thoughts of negotiating marriages for Elizabeth, but these would not have been like any kind of like major political marriages. These would have just been marriages that would have put Elizabeth in a, in a lower place setting. I wouldn't, would have made it so Elizabeth, Mary didn't have to worry anymore, but not a big political marriage. Although of course, you know, when, when Mary dies, Philip, right, puts his hat in the ring to marry Elizabeth right away. Mm -hmm. which is right. gross. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> does that, Nancy, I, does I that thought about my question? question. Yeah, we'll see. I think that was pretty, pretty good. Um, if you want to, oh yeah, she said yes, thanks. Awesome. I did have a question because I am reading the newest Matthew Shard Lake mystery right now. I love Matthew Shardlake. He is um, my favorite historical fiction. Do you ever have you ever read any of his? The C.J. Samson. Oh my God, they're so good. It's these his, it's these mysteries, and they're so good. So he's wrapped up in a case that Elizabeth before when um, Edward is the king, and and Elizabeth is Lady Elizabeth, and she's living at Hatfield, and he's wrapped up in this case that's related to her Boleyn family in Norfolk, and apparently she always kept in the book. I mean, it's historical fiction, but that's why I want to ask you what her relationships were like with her Boleyn relatives. They say, and it, I thought about it because you talked about Thomas Perry, because he makes, and he is a big part of the book, talking about how the Boleyn relatives are constantly showing up and Elizabeth has a soft spot in her heart for the Boleyn relatives that are like the distant Norfolk Boleyn clan. Is that, is that true? I would, I would think yes. I would, I would say that she does have a, a soft spot for her mother's family. Um, but she also recognizes the danger in her mother's family as well. So I would say there is, there's definitely a soft spot. And I think um, there was always, um, I think Anne certainly was always in the back of Elizabeth's mind as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. That was my question. All right. Well, you have been incredibly generous with your time. Thank you so much. Um, do you have like any, like, oh, there's no other, yeah, there's no other hands raised. Do you, where can people, like, do you have a place, do you like blog or Instagram or is there any place people can follow or do they just have to take your class? <laughs> I, I don't have anything right now. I, I, um, I don't have time to think generally. Um, I teach like 11 classes, college classes this semester. 
and I'm trying to like give myself time to work on my book. I have thought about like putting together a blog or something, but I, at this, I don't really know how to do that either. Okay. So <laughs> I really need your help and <laughs> how to do these things. Um, but I would like wordpress.com. It's free. <laughs> yeah. So okay. I would like, I would like to do something to start something, but um, I'm just not sure like, so we'll just stay tuned for your book. What the best like avenue for that is. So yeah, we can chat. That's okay. true. Okay. So we'll just watch for your book. So thank you so much for being so kind. Yeah, somebody said this was wonderful. Thank you for your knowledge and time. Somebody said, thanks so much. This was great. So oh, awesome. You. And I'm going to then put this out on my various places too, so it can get wider listenership and watching and everything. Oh, well, so. thank you everybody for coming. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for coming as well. Um, yeah. Thanks for being here. This was really fun. So thanks everybody for coming and thank you to Tammy, Tamara. Which do you prefer? Cause. Oh, I go by Tammy. Right. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you You're for welcome. being here and thank you for sharing everything and I'll everybody have a great rest of your day and thank you so much for being here. Awesome. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>